Welcome to the January 11th Ordinance Review Committee. This meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. First on the agenda is the roll call. Laura, can you do that please? Sure. Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Thorpe. Here. Member Peck. Here. And Member Napolitano. Here. Okay. Next up is public comment, but seeing how we don't have anyone in a public comment waiting room. Read the speech anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> I will save it. If someone joins us later, they will, we can allow them to be heard if they wish to be heard. So let's move on from public comment to the approval of minutes of December 15th, 2020. Move to approve. Motion made by Councilor Labarge. Do I hear second? I, I will second. Seconded yeah. by Councilor Jim Nash. I have corrections. Councilor Nash. Yes, um, so I seconded it, provided the second so we could discuss this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like to uh, postpone uh, approving these minutes until uh, our next meeting. Um, I, I didn't have a chance to adequately review them. I just sat down and, um, and Lord uh, did such a wonderful job. I, it's, it's worth spending the time reviewing them. Um, I know she just got them off today. So, um, that, that is my request that we postpone voting on these till our next meeting. Okay. Any of the other members? Yes, I, I see a couple of very minor non-content grammatical. I'll second Jim's request on that. Okay. Do you want us to just send them to me? Be oh, I guess then we did have the discussion about how they should be approved by the body. But um, so yeah, go. either way. Councilor Nash. I, I think it's fine for us to hear uh, Member Peck's uh, mm -hmm. recommendations to improve the the draft here. Um, I'm 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 fine with doing that, and then next time when we, you know, yeah. So take one minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, this is very cursory review as well. The number one meeting call to order roll call. Mm -hmm. um, could you add member before my name just for consistency? Sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think there's five. Um, last paragraph. Um, Did you say page five? I think this is page five. One. Yeah, so last paragraph. The member pack reported back on her communication with Wayne Fiden. Maybe it's just page five for me because I. Oh, okay. Six for me. Well, not just before I print it out. Um, if community action of Palmyra Valley could be capitalized. Sure. That'd be great. And the very last page, number nine, adjourn. Uh, my last name is misspelled. Whoops. Did I say paid? I Okay. okay. I'm getting a lot of interference from somewhere. I know, me too. Hmm. I think it might be uh, Megan's papers as she was going through oh. them for her pages. Probably right. <coughs> Got away from the mic. Councilor Nash. So I think to uh, uh, postpone uh, approving these minutes, we need to um, have the person who made the motion withdraw the motion, who had, who was Councilor Labarge, and then present a new motion. Attorney Seawald will hop in and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. Councilor <laughs> Labarge will retract her motion. 
Yes, Councillor Bart. I couldn't hear you. You're gonna you're gonna retract your motion to yes, put this I'm on. Yes, I'm gonna retract it. Okay. It's too bad Councillor Nash didn't say that right from the beginning. <laughs> I think Councillor Council Nash also has retracted his retract yes. second. Oh, I, re I retract my second. Thank you, Attorney Seawald. Okay. And so, do a motion to move the approval of minutes to the next meeting of the Ordinance Review Committee. Move do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? I think we have to discuss. Unless we could just say by consent that we agreed it's to by, it's by, by, on the by next agenda. We are agreeing to this. Correct? I, um, yes. I think because it, usually we, we could do that if we were all in the same room, but since we're in Zoom, I think we have to do a roll call for roll everything. Roll call. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. That's been moved. Moving on now to format and structure of the executive summary. Now, Member Peck has provided us with a um, executive summary. I hope everyone had the chance to look at it. Um, it's now open for discussion. Megan, would you like to be heard first on this? Um, sure, just very quickly. Um, I think uh, a, a couple of our members, attorney, have often brought up that it's easier to discuss the topic when we have something to look at. So um, this is really just a very rough draft to kind of get us literally on the same page. Um, I haven't had any input uh, for this from any of you, any, anyone outside of this committee. So I expect, you know, I am open to all of that. Um, so, you know, I, I think that I'm not always, I'm not always very assured that we, you know, we all, you know, consent to this. I, we all agree on the same objectives um, or are able to kind of articulate our path forward um, until the end of March, uh, especially when we don't have um, an invited speaker to help structure our meetings. So I hope that will help open up, this will help open up that discussion tonight as well. So. Thank you. And I appreciate you doing this and, 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 and it's greatly appreciated and your, your rough draft is, is something that would take me six months to do. So uh, thank you very much, Megan, for what you've done. Well, Councillor like Nash. I agree, Councillor Thorpe. It would take me just about as long and I, it was a really great summary of, uh, I, I think it really lays out um, what our, our our charges, our goals. It, uh, it mentions the resolution, um, and um, and I, I I think it's it's a great op a great opening. And we'll see, you know, how much more we need to add to it once we reach the deadline. But I I like that it's that it's uh, brief and to the point, and that um, which is what I think in general. What most of it. What our summary report is going to look like that it's going to be a lot of here's what we found now everybody go do some work and um so anyway thank you for for pulling that together councilor barge yep, i want to thank you megan it's very well organized yes i read it i read it several times and i think you put it right where it's at what we've been talking about and our concerns of the direction that we should be going in. So I thank you. Any other comments? Attorney Seawald. 
I'd like to have your feedback. I didn't get a lot of time to go through this in detail, but it, it does state um, an overview of how we approach this. Of course, the devil is going to be in the details of how we analyze and, and, uh, and make recommendations to the, uh, to the city council and, and to the mayor. But um, I do think this gives us a, a good overview. As I said, I didn't really have a lot of time today. I was um, in the middle of something that was very time consuming. Uh, and, uh, but I'm sure I'll have some, uh, um, some comments on it. And, and I'm sure I will want to just change a few words like, um, like the word harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that they're having, um, you know, they, they have uh, impacts on, on marginalized communities, but, you know, you, you know, so there might be some some word choices, but I think it does give a, a good you know thirty thousand foot overview of how you approach this. Now, of course, uh, the uh, city council resolution uh, was something that is an identity. It doesn't say really whose resolution is. That's another thing I would have indicated. This was a city council resolution, um, and you know just small things like that. But I agree with the councilors that this does give us a very good overview. You know, I mentioned actually policy areas that we haven't really broached yet. Um, just because we haven't had the opportunity. Um, but I also don't know how, I don't know your thoughts about this. Oh, I mean, I'm addressing all the members here. Um, Certainly, we've talked a lot about zoning and rental housing, parking, nuisance laws, but the other areas that were identified by the National League of Cities, purchasing, hiring, recreation, land ownership, I believe. I don't know how we feel about how we feel about you know working in those areas. Um, we haven't had any recommendations come across a transom related, I don't, in those areas, but should we, please. Attorney Seawall. Uh, you know, I had a, uh, a conversation with the chair after our last meeting. And one of the things I imparted to the chair is that if you're really gonna get into, the, into any depth in any of these areas, you should start limiting how many more areas you're going to move into. And some of these things are, uh, th th it's a big bite to chew, um, you know, dealing with um, intergenera intergenerational wealth inequality. I I'm not really sure what we're, what you're going to do with that. Uh, you know, there are other areas, but um, unequal educational opportunities. I don't know that there are ordinances that are going to impact educational opportunities. Uh, I mean, all of these things are legitimately concerns, uh, but I just don't know that they're concerns that are reflected in any way in our ordinances and that our ordinances contain anything that, that uh, impacts you know, those topics. And again, you know, it's really a question of how deeply into any of these areas you, this committee wants to go because, you know, we're halfway through June, J January. And so, Essentially, we have six weeks to, you know, mm -hmm. study these things and get get a report written and filed. So that was my recommendation to uh, the Council of Thorpe, and I, I share that with the committee. This is very useful to know and exactly the type of discussion I hope to have. Um, you know, this is clearly just like a laundry list of things that came to mind, structural causes of systemic racism. and. Um, we need to, I think we need to, um, we just need to just, we need to just find this report why we, why we narrow our focus to only certain, certain topics and not others, certain causes and not others. And, you know, a lot of that is we are limited by the six months that we have of our existence. Um, and it could be simply because we, they're not, we didn't have the opportunity to, because they, you know, um, they have not been raised with us by the public, by agency heads, by counselors, um, 
I'm fine with that. Um, I do we have any strong feelings about whether to kind of go for breadth or depth? Councilor Nash. Yeah, uh, Member Peck, I really appreciate you you bringing these um, these ideas to the table. Uh, that um, that I I think that some of these are are, are more have much more to do with um, initiatives rather than the actual law. Laws are about more you know more about barriers and you know what's what we're going to do allow and not allow and things like that. Whereas there, there's programming and initiatives that the city can take on to open, um, open up more opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think there's gonna be ongoing discussion. I just wanna say, what, I think we're gonna come up with a, a list of things that we, towards the end of our, our work here that we, we would like the city to keep looking into and pursuing. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, land ownership. I, I know, uh, for example, I, I know that the planning department is about to uh, move forward with a number of zoning recommendations that have to do with, you know, addressing affordable housing and, and how, um, how, how we go about uh, creating, you know, because right now we're tied in with the state in terms of creating overlays for affordable housing districts, how we can actually do that ourselves within the community. Um, and there's a, and I, uh, on Thursday night, there's a hearing on two, um, two families across the two family mm -hmm. uh, uh, housing a lot uh, allowed across the entire city. So mm -hmm. there's those things going on. There's also uh, in as far as recreation, over the summer there was a there was a um, a lot of tension around people accessing uh, the city's waterways, and that um, and that the the planning department actually held some meetings over, over the um, over the winter to kind of suss out you know what's the best approach. Um, I know that the uh, the DPW is looking at ways to accommodate parking or mm -hmm. at least to identify where parking can safely occur um, around those areas where there was all there was a lot of pressure for um, people trying to get to the river. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, the, in a lot of ways, these discussions are already happening. And mm -hmm. I think what's important is for all of us to keep saying, okay, we've done that. What's the next thing we can do? And um, so I think there's a lot of ongoing uh, work to be done here. Um, so, um, but those are just some of the things. And I mean, we, we just had all of these charter review things. One of them had to do with allowing, um, you know, non-citizens to have the, the right to vote, you know, residents or non-citizens the right to vote in, in local elections. Um, so there's the, there's a host of things that we're that the city is working on it at, at many levels mm -hmm. and um, and I I think what 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 would be helpful for us is um, as we're ticking the, these things off if there's like a particular area like oh there's one there's an idea that we can toss to uh, the planning department or we can toss it to DPW or maybe even school committee you know that that they can um, uh, address some of these ideas as they're popping up. But I have to say, the more we discuss about, you know, all, all of, you know, the, our, how, do we, how do we bring social justice to bear on the way this city does its business? I'm, I'm like, I'm increasingly surprised that like, oh, we're already doing this and we're doing that. And, um, and there's a lot of momentum. So um, anyway, I, I have this habit of talking too much. I'm sorry. So somebody else talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nash. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I just got to read this now because I just got out of work not too long ago. Um, and I'm, um, I appreciate um, Megan, you writing it um, and I, especially I'm the most interested, I think, in 
the stuff that's en encompassed in the last couple of paragraphs, um, I think I've been thinking about this because, you know, there are these three buckets. Um, I guess we're stuck with that uh, terminology at this point um, of of content, and I think the first bucket is pretty uncontroversial and so forth. Uh, and I think the the issue for me is um, whether to focus on something that is like ameliorative versus something that's um, uh, forward looking. And I um, and and I've had conversations actually with some folks about you know what is possible within the scope of you know reviewing the ordinances and even in, uh, implementing new ones. Um, I mean, certainly the housing ordinance that um, Somerville in, in Boston has um, implemented is a good step in the right direction. But it's sort of like playing defense as opposed to um, trying to make positive change. Um, and so um, um, I. Uh, we, we've talked about lots of different things and, and uh, many things, many of those things are, are good and we should definitely include them. Um, but I'm just wondering about the question that I've been asking myself more, most recently is what are the things that we can do that will um, not simply address things um, that um, problems as for the but can what can be of the city that will actually be um, progressive, not the political, not in the partisan or whatever term, but but truly progressive. And um, and I'm not sure about what that is. But the things that the topics that you identified um, in the, the bottom of your um, um, of the the summary certainly are the things that I'm I'm most interested in talking about and trying to brainstorm around what's possible. Um, that's okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Attorney Seawald. I, I just want to uh, um, address briefly uh, Councillor Nash's um, alluding to things such as, um, you know, access to waterways and uh, I just want to make sure that we're staying on ordinances because um, you know some of this just you know isn't really um, uh, something that can be done by ordinance. And there are a lot of civil relationships, contractual relationships that cities and towns cannot uh, legislate in. So you just have to be. And I and while all of these um, concerns are valid, uh, I, I just want to keep shepherding you back into the ordinances and make sure you're, you're focusing on what can be done by ordinance. Because again, um, a lot of what happens in this city happens on the executive side. And so uh, when it comes to land use, certainly those are ordinances. But, you know, um, for instance, um, a proposal came up that, uh, that uh, suggests that we have an ordinance that would prohibit uh, rental brokers from charging tenants the commission and require that the rental brokers charge the landlord the commission. We can't do that. Okay, Those are civil relationships. Those are contractual relationships that we don't have the authority to regulate. Uh, I do believe we have the uh, authority to require certain things to be included with the notice to quit has been discussed. But that's a little bit different. So I just, you know, I also want to just caution you about the limits of legislation on the local level. And could you, you know, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's right. Uh, just, so could you delineate instead of just taking it piece by piece, uh, instance by instance? What is the general delineation like? Why can you? Um, why could uh, there be something created around the notice to quit, but not around who pays the rental fee? Or okay. The, the fee? So, so the. the um, I'll give you a, a one minute history lesson <clears throat> on local legislation. Prior to 1964, I believe it was, we were a limited home rule jurisdiction, meaning that we could only legislate in areas that the state legislature gave us specific permission to legislate in. Okay? So we had permission to legislate zoning. We had you know, that sort of thing. 
1964, there was a constitutional amendment, a home rule amendment was passed. And now we have the authority to legislate in any area that is not occupied by the state and does not alter civil relationships. So what does that mean? If there are, um, if, if there are comprehensive state regulations, for instance, I will tell you an example, in Wendell tried to have its own pesticide law. The Supreme Judicial, Judicial Court said, no, that's a comprehensive state legislative scheme. You can't legislate in that area. Okay? So if the legislature says either, no, you can't legislate in this area, or the legislature has created such a comprehensive legislative scheme that the field is occupied, that's the legalese, then we can't legislate in that area. This Home Rule Amendment had a list of, also had a list of areas that cities and towns can't legislate in. We can't have our own tax laws. That's why we can't pass taxes, um, you know, new taxes unless the state legislature allows us to. One of the one of the areas that is prohibited are ordinances that alter civil relationships, and the contract between uh, a broker and the landlord is a contract. It's a civil relationship and Northampton cannot have its own contract law. That's what I mean by that. So um, I hope that answered your question. It's just a fundamental limitation on the ability of cities and towns to legislate as the inferior sovereign vis-a-vis -vis the state. The same analysis happens between the state and the federal government. The states can't legislate in areas that the federal government has occupied completely. So um, the other thing is that we have a charter that is a strong mayor form of government. So um, that means that the, the uh, legislature, the city council can never act in an executive function and the, the mayor as the executive can never act as the legislature. And so all of the, the uh, <clears throat> all of the control over city departments is vested with the mayor. So the policies on, on how um, the departments carry out their functions um, is, is left to the mayor. So the city council can make general policy in some areas, but the, the mayor carries it out. And so um, I'm, I hope I'm answering your question. Sure, but just, I mean, there's one, one thing is, you know, at the, our, in our last meeting, you said that, um, that the city council once established that uh, agent, city agencies are allowed to set their own fees. That's right, because there's a statute, chapter 40, section 22F, that requires that to be done by ordinance. That's a, a prime example of where the legislature has limited how cities and towns can act, and it has to be done by ordinance. No, 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 so I was just one, saying that that's an example of, uh, of the legislative branch, the city council doing something, that's not, that's not something that the mayor does, right? So that, that's, well, a, that's well, an example of uh, the city, the city council setting a policy, not the, um, not the mayor necessarily. No, that's not true because I'm just chapter 40, 22 F basically says that if this statute is accepted, then each department gets to set its own fees. So once the city council voted to accept 22 F, it then shifted all of the policymaking over to the mayor and to the executive branch. So the so now the city council has no power to set fees in departments. Only the departments with the approval of the mayor can do that. But that's because the city council said that's the case. They gave the authority. That's right. To the they mayor. they set the policy right under the statute, yeah. and now the mayor carries out. So the mayor is going to decide what the fees are for. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I know, understand. Alarm. Just, yeah, yeah, sure. And just one other question is, what is the definition of a civil relationship? That's a very good question. There is no definition of it. You know, it's one of these, I know it when I see it, but there's no definition of a civil relationship. It clearly contracts are civil relationships. We can't have our own tort law. So in other words, negligence means something different in Northampton than it does um, in every other city in town. So um, there's no definition. Should we come up with a definition of it? I mean, it, would that be helpful in terms of 
I see you shaking your head. <laughs> no, because the city of Northampton can't have a de different definition of civil relationships than every other city in town. And the SJC decides what those civil relationships are. The SJC decides what the limits of legislative power uh, are uh, for every city in town. So if it's uh, uh, a relationship that can't be legislated in Northampton, it can't be legislated in any other city in town. But you're saying it's not defined. It's not it's defined. Not clearly. It's not defined at all. Possible to encapsulate some of what you said, Attorney Seawald, in, in our report. I feel like there's a lot of kind of universal misunderstanding about our role and our purview. And um, yeah, the limits of this, this committee, um, even a definition of an ordinance. Um, and well, that's, that's clear. An ordinance is a legislative act, uh, which would be passed by the city council and, and approved by the mayor. Uh, that's an ordinance. I mean, understand, but you know, in the months that we've been meeting, we have discussed many, many ideas that are, I, I don't know if this is real term, policy adjacent, um, without regard to whether they, they would actually be, I don't know, executive actions or, or resolutions or ordinances. And we're just more like, uh, like you said at our first meeting, this is more the the philosophical view, um, the background of ordinances um, or of, of public policies, really. Um, so I just, um, and I'm fine. I'm not trying to be, I don't think we should be overly ambitious and try to you know, take on systemic racism um, with our work or within this report. But um, if we are to, if we are to narrow our focus, we I think we need to rationalize it into, and we need to we need to explain it to our. Um, and this is the other thing I I that I um, I you know as the, an advisory body I thought that we are we were reporting to both the mayor and the city council, so both the executive and legislative branches, um, so that clear things for me a bit. So, so look, let me give you another example, Member Pack. Um, you know, when you talk about intergenerational wealth, I mean, I, I would, you know, you need to think about what, whether there is any room for ordinances that affect that. I mean, intergenerational wealth is uh, a function of our uh, intestacy statutes, uh, where you know, you can write up a document and leave all of your wealth to the next generation. Or if you don't leave the document, this is what happens. This is to get your wealth. There's nothing that we can do about that. There's no ordinance that can change that. Um, wills are wills and they're a civil relationship between generations and that are based upon common law and statutes that have been around for forever, came here from England. And and there's nothing that we can do to prevent somebody uh, from passing wealth to the next generation. That is a, like I said, it was kind of a, a quick and dirty laundry list. No, I, I'm not being critical at all. I just, I, you know, and, and Again, you know, if you feel like that's, you know, that terms like that should be, you know, Struck from the report, um, I, I can understand that just for the sake of clarity because we, but you know, I, I do see that I think the city is, does recognize that um, intergenerational equity is, is important. I mean, part of, what is this written up by, this is on the planning, um, this was part of uh, Wayne Biden's uh, presentation to us. I um, mean, he talked about how the, Initiatives of the city are focused on four different types of equity, distributional equity, structural equity, trans or intergenerational equity. How do decisions we make today affect opportunities for future generations um, and procedural equity? Um, so it's not, I, I don't feel like it's completely a new idea. It isn't. 
for the city and I don't think it's that I mean I'm not I mean personally I don't I don't you know think it's harmful to to raise that because part of what we're doing I think in this report is just general education um, see that's where I differ what we're doing is reviewing ordinances we're reviewing ordinances this is not this is not just a free roaming committee to identify social injustice. This is an ordinance review committee. We're reviewing ordinances to see whether we have the ordinances we need to promote equity where we can. And we're looking at ordinances that we do have, uh, as I understood it, uh, to see where we can improve, um, you know, equity issues in the city. But intergenerational wealth or, uh, uh, Know, unequal educational opportunities. I don't know of any ordinances that uh, that are inhibiting equal access to education. Um, I haven't seen any. Uh, you know, ordinances are much more, uh, much closer to the ground than that. Uh, you know, I can't hear you. I can't hear her, Laura. Zoning changes. I mean, potentially could affect. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. But. Remember, Peck, you're going in and out. I can't hear you. Yeah. Before. I mean, I'm not saying, I mean, okay. it's not necessarily very, you know, we're not going to be able to have, find or create uh, ordinances that are directly address any of these causes. But, you know, on a much broader level, I mean, I, like, I don't know if you heard this, but I, I was just thinking zoning, the zoning changes could affect where people choose to live and where their children go to school. I lost her. Yeah, we can't hear her at all. Wonder why. I don't know. I think she's backing off. Mm -hmm. Or is something covering her microphone? Could be. Huh. We can't hear you. Yeah, Not at all. She doesn't like what I'm saying. Oh, and there. Did you hear oh. that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hmm. No, I can't hear. You know, or. Hmm. Um. Does she have her microphone on? Yes, because we hear her sometimes, and then she cuts out. It started out at a normal volume, and then it just faded away. So it's. Understand. Maybe you should um, exit and come back in. That might help. Yeah. <laughs> Bye -bye. Megan, I have an idea. This happened yes. to me the other night with council. So can I suggest this real quick? The fix, if you uh, go up to the top, see where it says Zoom US, hover over that, mm -hmm. and now go to preferences. OK. Do you see a microphone? Yes. It, what is it, what's your volume set for? Input volume. Um, it's grayed out. Oh, it's all the way up? No, it's a- Grayed out. Oh, so slide the, slide the thing, the, you can slide the button over there and, and increase the input volume. Okay. I it's automatically adjusted. Is this better? Oh, that oh, made a big difference. Louder. You know what? It's on the automatic adjustment. Okay, there we go. Right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a technical geek now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're the troubleshooter. <laughs> oh, so, Megan, if you want to start with what you were sure. saying well, I'm, earlier. I'm relieved. I, I wasn't. <laughs> um, I. Do I just start over? <laughs> I'm not sure. What <laughs> so, um, oh, did I? We, we lost I, most of it. Really? Yeah. Oh, great. About a minute and a minute. The last minute, probably. You want to hear it? Go ahead. Try. <laughs> um, where was I? 
the um so um it, it sounds to me like attorney Seawald wants to keep our report very very narrowed and very very tight and he doesn't really want to explore the what you what I thought you termed the philosophical background for for um, public policy that that we're looking at. So um, we're um, I, I, I have no problem with philosophy, uh, and I have no problem with background. I just want to keep you moored to the ordinances and thinking about things that actually can be done through ordinances. That's all. And you know when I and um, and. I think that when counselors get on the council, some of them, particularly when we changed to a charter in 2012, after that, people, councils were surprised at how little was done by ordinance. When you look through that ordinance book, there's not a whole lot that's done by ordinance in this city. And so I just, all I'm trying to keep you is, is as I said, more to the ordinances. And this was a problem in charter also. Um, I kept having to uh, stop them and say, okay, what does this have to do with the charter? And I just want to know what it has to do with ordinances and the limitations on legislative authority in the city. And, um, you know, not just a philosophical rendering of, you know, societal ills that include Northampton. And a lot of them do. And there's a lot more to be done than can be done through ordinances. And a lot of it will be done as policy in the departments. Mm -hmm. I think there's not necessarily recognition that these are all society ills or these are problems that are affecting Northampton residents. And that I feel like is important to point out somewhere in our report. And we certainly don't need to go into depth. Um, <laughs> you know, I feel, um, I think most people will be fine just with a cursory mention. Um, and um, if we could relate them, you know, we will, I think the, this is not the report in Citerity. This is just a possible beginning. Um, I have no doubt that most of the report will be about much more specific ordinances and um, or specific ordinances and um, or other sort of policy, you know, ordinance adjacent type of ideas that have come across, uh, um, come to us um, in the meetings um, from from the public, so, um, but, but I, I agree with Member Napolitano that um, we we should take maybe more of a critical look at the existing ordinances as well, and not assume that. I mean, and be more concerned about their um, implications, and rather than the intent, because the the intent is never. It's never harmful, um, yet we know the status quo isn't serving um, many people of the city. So anyway, I'd like to hear what Member Napolitano like to, has to say. Yeah. So um, I, I'm trying to, um, I, I understand the, the issue of having to ground the issues um, that we see as, you know, discrimination um, and, and unfair uh, advantages and disadvantages in the basic rules, like the ordinances. Um, but I'm trying to, to figure out like the distinction between, you know, I would say that housing um, and like the cost of, you know, the, the issue of like renting stuff is a uh, um, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of, it, it's a fairly occupied civil relationship that the state has on this issue. Um, but yet they're in Boston and, and in Somerville, they've um, passed this ordinance about informing, uh, landlords about, you know, you have to tell your, your tenants that there are these rights and so forth. So why is that, um, permissible? Um, whereas something like setting a minimum wage in Northampton, not permissible. Or, or you know, or tax, uh, okay, tax is, is a different thing because I know that there's a whole 
that's a very occupied civil relationship in the state. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I guess what is yeah what is the distinction? Why why was that? Why is something like that allowed, um, whereas setting a minimum wage in Northampton is not allowed? An ordinance that does that. I haven't specifically studied minimum wage, but um, I would think that that was um, an occupied field that the state has taken that and decided for cities for everyone what the minimum wage in Massachusetts is going to be. Again. None of this is black and white. And that's why we, we litigate these issues. And that's why it's the SJC that de decides generally which side of the line it's on. Um, I can see that a land, uh, a, an employer-employee relationship could be deemed a, a civil relationship between two contracting parties and you're prohibiting uh, a, a contractual relationship outside of the bounds of the $25 or whatever it is minimum wage, if that's what the city decided. Um, so uh, I haven't studied that specifically, but I think it would be problematic. I think it would be very problematic. Um, I will also okay. say that. Yeah, I, I get, I also, I get why it's, yeah, sorry. I, you know, I would also say that I've been in contact with, uh, with the council in both of the communities that have adopted that after we talked about it, I, com I contacted them. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share my emails with you, but uh, basically, um, you know, what they said is, we think we can do this, and, uh, but it hasn't been challenged. So why and, do they think they can do it? Because you, you would think that housing, you know, laws about, there's lots of law, there's housing law that you would think that it's an right. occupied field. And, and when I, and, and I also, uh, I had to speak to Bill Newman about something else. So I said, what do you think of this bill? He said, you can't do that. And then we talked it through and he said, well, you know, maybe it's a consumer protection law. Maybe it's like the lemon law. Maybe it's like the lead paint law. Uh, but the first thing he says, oh no, you can't do that. That's the completely occupied field. I said, well, Bill, Boston did this, Somerville did this, and Chelsea's about to do it. Uh, and so we, we spent literally an hour on the phone talking about it. You can ask, we spent an hour on the phone talking about this because different people can disagree about this. I think we can do it. I think it's a consumer protection law. It's a notice. It is not inconsistent with, uh, certainly the state has not by statute prohibited cities and towns from doing it. Um, uh, there is bare minimum of what needs to be in a, in a notice to quit, but uh, it's not frustrating that in any way. And then the question is, is that statute occupying the field? I don't know the answer to that question, Jeff. And I don't think, and Bill didn't know the answer to the question. And the city solicitors out east don't know the answer to that question, but they're willing to, uh, you know, roll that dice and see whether a court tells them they can't do it. That's exactly what they're doing. And I don't have a problem, you know, you know, taking risks. The the real reason I talked about I, I called Bill was because I was afraid that there was forced speech here, and Bill's are obviously Bill's my First Amendment go-to guy, and so. I talked to him, what do you think about the forced speech part of this, requiring landlords to speak against their interests, to give you know, information about the people who are, uh, exist in this world to make landlords' lives miserable and forcing them to say that. That's why I called Bill. And we talked through that a lot. And you know, then it's like a lemon law or, or the lead paint law. Or just a, uh, but the first thing he said was, oh, no, you can't do that. That field's occupied by state law. So. You know, I have now four lawyers and, and we all have different, you know, differing opinions, but there are some things that are black and white. You know, we can't, you know, invade, you know, intergenerational transfer of wealth. We can't invade basic contract law, basic tort law. Uh, there are just some things we know we can't do. Um, and so uh, I, what I'm saying is, I think we can do this. It's not definitely no, but it's certainly not definitely yes. And that's, you know, welcome to my world. I, have I, get, to I get the sense that there's almost nothing that's a definitely yes. <laughs> you know, well, that, that's the lawyer's hedge. But, uh, but, you know, for somebody like me who spends his life practicing in public, you know, most lawyers get to advise their clients in private. And if, you know, if it doesn't work out, you know, two people know. The other side and my client. If it doesn't work out for me, everybody in the city knows. So, uh, you know, maybe that's why we're a little bit more conservative about what we're willing to, to do. But in this case, I'm certainly not, uh, you know, I would certainly not 
uh, recommend against passing something like this, even if it were struck down, because I think it's, you know, it's an important thing. Uh, what I didn't want us to want to do is put us in a position of violating someone's First Amendment rights and all the attendant damages and attorney's fees and all this, all the rest of it. That I, that I'll be very conservative about. But if some yeah. judge is just going to tell me, no, you can't do this, take it off your books. Oh, okay, fine. I understand the rumors that Bill Newman is a lot less fearsome in court than people think. He doesn't go to court. <laughs> he couldn't find a court if you put a ring in his nose right now. He hasn't been to court in 10 years. He used, he used to. Yeah. He used to, not anymore. <laughs> I don't go to court anymore either. I won't be defending this. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's where we are. So, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, unduly inhibit your 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 progress, but I, I, I do want you to just keep your focus on, on the ordinances. And we've been talking about zoning and we've been talking about parking fines, uh, which is, uh, you know, as you saw, mostly state, uh, you know, most of the fines are state. Uh, but, you know, we've been talking about things that are in the ordinances mostly. And, you know, I just want to make sure that we stay in the ordinances, because this is the Ordinance Review Committee. And this is the first time I will say that in th that I've been here, and I've been here in doing this since 2012, that the ordinances have been reviewed for anything except for very concrete issues. You know, we had just passed the new charter. We had to sort of go through the ordinances and see what was consistent with the charter, what wasn't. So there wasn't a philosophical uh, approach. It was a very mechanical approach. You know, what's on this side, what's on the legislative side, what's now on the executive side. So this is new for me also. Right. I mean, and certainly if it remained that way, um, I wouldn't be here, <laughs> right? Um, uh, the mayor specifically said he wanted to, he needed to appoint someone from the Human Rights Commission to shed, um, you know, that perspective on your work. So um, I just, I do feel like a sense of responsibility to, you know, educate the public as every, as you know, the report that we produce, like everything the city does is for public consumption. Um, and so I, I do feel like it needs to be, we need to kind of address some, a lot of them, perhaps misconceptions. Um, we do need to define what we're talking about. I really don't think most people understand what an ordinance is. Yes, there is a hard and fast definition for that, but really, um, and you know, if you could shed light on like what what the limitations of, you know, how that interacts with, you know, statutes, uh, and all that that would be helpful. I I just you know the, um, we're we're an advisory body, and, um, but you know this. Well, Meetings have attracted interest from more people than I expected. And um, so I do think, I, I mean, I'm just going back to the fact that we do need to cover more than just like the technical review of ordinances in our report. And that could be brief, but, you know, I don't necessarily think that people expect us to. Um, just simply because it's mentioned, you know, people expect us to have done something about it in the six months of our existence. We are simply raising, <coughs> stating our, our values. Um, Perhaps the, so the, the bigger but, issues could be, a, could be identified as by explaining in the report why it is that these are not issues that can really be dealt with yes, through exactly. an interview. And that these are things that, that you know, we would hope that would be uh, addressed, uh, you know, in any other way that, that, that they can be addressed, including through resolutions, executive orders, departmental exactly. orders, and that sort of thing. But yes. you know, again, uh, I don't want, I, I, um, the reason I cautioned earlier is that there isn't a lot of time. So if you really want to get into the ordinances and look at ordinances that, that can be changed or can be created in order to ameliorate some of these 
you know, social ills that, that you've been identifying, I would, I, I'm just trying to sort of corral you back into that focus. That's all. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to try and draft something that explains why we aren't addressing intergenerational wealth and, and property transfers and things like that's all, you know, we can't. And so uh, we call upon the legislature, we call upon the mayor, we call upon the departments mm -hmm. to, uh, to do what they can with these issues. But again, you don't have a lot of time. So I would hope that you would, you know, figure out exactly how you're going to address the ordinances that can be changed or created to, uh, to improve our city. That's really what I think that the charter is intending. What, you know, by having, you know, ordinance review periodically uh, in order to update them and make sure that they are serving the public in the best way possible uh, to ameliorate whatever issues you identify. Council LaBarge. Council LaBarge. My hand is tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Seawald. Um, I think you explained it to the best that you could. I was on this committee at one time and going over five years of ordinances and so forth. And the mayor has the power, city council we can go ahead and help and design ordinances and so forth. I know that for a fact. I've helped many counselors working on ordinances, resolutions down the line. Ellen, you had mentioned something to the effect, yes, that city counselors had given the clearance of letting departments go ahead and set their fines or whatever, the cost. Can counselors go ahead and change that? Once it's set, can we turn around as counselors and change that? In order to unaccept the statute, and I haven't looked at 22F specifically, which is the statute that was accepted, but the general rule is that once a city or town accepts the statute, unless there's a specific provision in the statute to unaccept it, you would need this, uh, a legislative act to unaccept it. Thank you. Also, too, I think where a problem is here because of such an outcry in the city, and I feel the same way, like Megan does and so forth, about housing. I mean, we all know housing is a serious problem here <clears throat> in the city of Northampton. At one time, I remember on Barrett Street and Mary Claire Higgins, our mayor, she was fantastic. Um, try to do the, um, what do they call that? The um, rental rule or something. She wanted to place a rule where they could not go up on the rent or anything like that. Do you remember that, Alan? I was not solicitor during uh, uh, Mayor uh, Higgins' uh, administration. It was rent I, control. I, That's what it was. Right. But but we can't do rent control anymore because the state has has banned us from doing rent control. That right. you know that's one of the examples of where the state says you shall not regulate and legislate in this area, and now it's it's forbidden. So, and, right. uh, and that's been but that might have been before I was town council in Amherst when that was passed because we had rent con <laughs> we had rental regulation in Amherst, um, and it and it got you know. I mean, during our, budget, down. during our budget hearing, we heard last year people asking us because of the cost of what people are paying by landlords in this city of controlling the rent. And I knew we could not do that, you know, so it's a big problem here. And I can see where the concern is for people living in this city. I do have to say, Megan, you really should get connected on Thursday night at seven o'clock with the planning board and listen to what is being presented on the ordinances of changing the zoning on it. And I think it's critical. I've been going over with it. I've been working with some other people on these ordinances. 
and I think it's opening up the doors for a big change here in the city. So anyways, I want to thank you, Megan, because I know where you're at with this, mm -hmm. with so many issues here, and it's like our hands are tied here right now. Um. <clears throat> Megan? I, um, Councillor Nash had his hand. I can't see. Him. Okay, Councillor Nash. Yeah, uh, back to um, uh, Councillor Labarge's question to um, Attorney Seawald. So, it, so, for example, in the case of the police department has an administrative fee, I think is what it was called, around, you know, when um, a car is towed. And that, you know, that the, while the bulk of the cost for the towing it had to do with, oh, you know, Ernie's and the storage and things like that, but still there was like thirty or fifty dollars of of that fee that's set by the police department. How is it we or this committee could speak to that? Could we come up with a recommendation to the executive, to the mayor, to say we would like to see that fee dropped? I mean, is that a way to do it? Because it sounds like council can't just go and wave. We can't do something to make the fee go away. It, it's on the executive side, but we could make that recommendation to the mayor, correct? You can pass a resolution on any issue that you want to. Um, and if the city council wanted to pass a resolution calling upon the mayor to eliminate that fee or to reduce that fee, you have every authority to do that. So would you recommend that it come from city council to make that recommendation or from this committee? Well, you know, as I, as I said to member of PAC before, you know, it could be that you identify this particular fee as a concern and, and a fee that is disproportionately impacting uh, marginalized communities, recognizing that under 22F, you don't have the authority by ordinance to change that, but calling on the mayor to look at this and to uh, to you know reduce that fee or have the police department reduce that fee. If I remember correctly, under the administrative order, and I didn't, I haven't looked at this fee setting. Um, it it has to be approved by the mayor. Um, so um, uh, you know any of these areas, anything that you want to speak to, you can speak to the legislature about intergenerational transfers. You can, you know, all of that, you, you could address a resolution to the legislature and the city council does this all the time. And it's important that the city council do this because, you know, you, you build some momentum by having different communities addressing the legislature with these things and things do change when there's that kind of momentum. But that doesn't mean that you can actually change it by ordinance. Those are departmental policies at this point. So within our report, since that's this kind of, you know, while we're focusing on, or, on ordinances, we can all kind of say, hey, I think we all agree that, uh, we haven't voted on this, but that, hey, we would make a recommendation to the mayor that the police department not charge this fee when a car is towed. You know, I, so we could include a recommendation like that in our report? You can include anything you want in your report, okay? I, 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 but um, again, I, I'm trying to impress upon you that this is ordinance review, that you're, you know, this should be in passing. These are the things that, that you know, came to us as issues right. that we can't do anything sure. about in ordinance. And, and, you know, we call upon the city council to pass a resolution. We call upon the mayor to do something about this. Now let's talk about ordinances. Let's talk about what's in the zoning ordinance that can be changed. What's in you know these other ordinances that you've been talking about? Well, Jim, we'll have to put our heads together. <laughs> so, Attorney Seawall, just a you know um, question. So, let's say something like when the Northampton Housing Partnership came and spoke to us and they presented us with the, their version, even though they're still working on, I believe the Eviction Notification Act, Housing Stability Notification Ordinance. That is something that we could recommend in our report, correct? Yes. 
that is something that we can um, address in bucket number three, correct? Right. Correct. I think you can. Thank you. And one of the communities requires the notice to quit to be copied to the city. Okay. But then the question becomes, and this is something that uh, Attorney Newman and I discussed also, what happens in court if that hasn't been done? You know, what's, what's, you know, what's the consequence? I'm not sure that a court's going to not proceed with an eviction because a pamphlet that the city requires wasn't included. I don't know, um, but I have my doubts. What is the, I don't remember, is there a penalty that's established by an, by the ordinance for the yeah. landlord to not do that? In the original draft, I think it was $500. So I don't okay, know. Yeah, what okay. I'm not sure, yeah, 500. I don't know how uh, it's changed or not. Right, um, it's still being, but, okay. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to, in the, in the bulk of the report, we're gonna focus on existing ordinances and ordinances that are far along enough. I mean, as far along, at least in the stage of the, the um, Housing Civility Notification Act, correct? So we just, okay. The, the, the question is whether we draft, whether something, an ordinance is drafted or that you just recommend that an ordinance be drafted. And I mean, last time I suggested the latter only because who knows if the city council is gonna to wanna to do that. Um, and um, and you know, I think you have three votes here probably, but um, you know, I, I don't wanna be drafting for no reason. And if someone else has drafted it, you could include that along with your report. If somebody has presented you with a proposed ordinance, I don't have a problem with that. I think we'd probably also want to articulate certain aspects of it not to be um, taken out in 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 a in whatever Northampton drafts, just to make sure that there, or maybe you know, a penalty is doubled or something like that. Uh, I think there might be instead of just saying, "Hey, they did this here. Let's do this here," articulating that. There's these particular, you know, the the enforcement part of it is also as you know as or more important um, as the rest of it, basically. But I think articulating, not just handing it up, but just articulating the important parts of it would be something that we mm -hmm. can do in the report. There were a number of other um, zoning ordinances. Mm -hmm. Um, as well, and I don't know, I don't feel like we've applied a very critical lens to any of those in the way that, um, in the, in that way that Jeff has described. Um, another, um, another reason I wrote up this page is so we can I wanted to know if we are, there's, if we can start, if we, so if we're going to, moving beyond intergenerational wealth and equity and equal educational opportunities, um, barrier specific participation, that is, I don't know, I don't know if there are any ordinances that are related to that currently, but it's something that was also um, in the um, Charter Review Committee report. Should we start looking at, should we start looking at any relevant, looking for relevant ordinances? Megan, where are you looking at right now? 
Um, one of the documents that was uh, with this agenda was the. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, if I'm creating a lot of noise. Okay, I can't find it. What's that as under uh, topics for further study? Yep. I think you asked the question of whether the group wanted to start looking at ordinance of related to a particular topic, but I missed what the topic was that you oh. said if we're moving beyond intergenerational wealth and unequal education. And then I thought you mentioned a new, maybe others didn't hear either by. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that there was, why there was resounding silence. <laughs> well, I, I, I presume that I just missed it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I think you introduced another topic, but I didn't hear the topic. Barriers to civic participation. Another cause of systemic racism. Councilor Nash has his hand up. I can't. Councilor Nash, thank you. Um, so a, a thought I have around uh, barriers to civic participation has to do with um, it. We're actually practicing it right here, working. We are, we are meeting remotely and that um, and that and attorney Seawald will correct me probably to correct me to let me know I got it wrong. But anyway, that um, that we are doing this by order of the, the governor that we're allowed to meet in this manner. And I think that it, it's been, you know, uh, one of the things of COVID is this has been an experiment in how to do this. And I, I would, I will say that I feel our participation from the public has gone, uh, gone way up by, um, by having this barrier lifted on remote participation. Mm -hmm. And I think that for us to, I think it would good, be good for us to allow for remote participation for, for meetings. I know we were dabbling around in it before, um, before COVID hit and we, were, we weren't really open to it. You know, we, we had come up with ways for like, you know, city councilors could, you know, under certain conditions, they could, you know, uh, remotely con come into council. But I, I think the, the doors that this has opened and the, the, the way that it's, it's reaching out to people has been really terrific. I also think that at the same time, it, it's allowed into the room people with access to technology that it's left a lot of people behind at the same time. There's, there's one particular individual who I work with every council meeting to get her voice into the room for public comment because all she has is a dial-up telephone. Mm -hmm. And prior to uh, uh, working remotely, if she wanted to say, you know, participate in city council, she would come to public comment, she would sit through the meeting. Um, so it's, it's opened up some doors, there's barriers at the same time, uh, but I, I think that, you know, something around remote participation would be really cool. Attorney Seawald, tell me what I got wrong. <laughs> Attorney Seawald, the open meeting law requires a corporal convening of the of the members, yeah. and so um, and that has been suspended during COVID. So this again, this would be state law. We don't have it. You know, we don't have the authority to change that. You could call upon the governor. Uh, and the state legislature to change the open meeting law. But again, until they eliminate the requirement of a corporal convening and, and have uh, you know, the provision for missing one meeting, uh, you know, catching up by watching or listening and then participating as, in the future in hearings particularly, um, 
There's not a thing that we can do about that. Mm -hmm. So you're referring to the, the body itself uh, meeting together in the same room. But what about ro remote participation for, um, for the public? That can be done. I don't see why that couldn't be done. I'm not sure the technology is there, but if it is, um, you know, and, and the city council appropriates the, the necessary funds to create it, there's where the city council has its power, by the way. Yeah. Megan? I hear what you're saying, Councillor Nash, but I think I, I interpret that a little bit differently than you. Um, your specific participation isn't necessarily, you know, and, and just enabling technological access for more groups of people to come and listen to meetings on Zoom. I think civic participation should be really having people in positions, diversity people, really um, racial diversity of people with influence and discretion to make the decisions. That's not happening right now in the city. Um, and so we, I, I feel like that's, um, you know, it's very easy to, to just fall back on saying we are, you know, these, what I'm seeing is, I mean, it's not lost on me that, um, you know, uh, I'm one of very few um, BIPOC residents who have any sort of interaction with city officials on a regular basis. Um, and um, I, I think I know the barriers that I had, I encountered and continue to encounter to, to be present at these meetings, to even participate in the meetings as, as an audience member. Um, and um, I, would like to, I would like to talk about what we can do to really put people, <laughs> to really diversify the people that are here on the screen, who are who are in council, who are in the city administration, and I don't know if that's something we can do through ordinances, or is that it's something that we should just we really should just raise as an issue in the report. I don't even know if you agree with me that there are barriers to civic participation as I describe it. Yeah, I, so I'm not at a hundred percent, I'm not, so what, so what I was speaking to had to do with public participation and really opening the door up to everybody to be involved. I mean, the, the, the whole uh, Black Lives Matter and the defund the police folks that participated in the, uh, the budget process, those people, some of them would have been in the room if we were meeting um, it, it together in council chamber, but 500 people would not have been in the room. And that, um, and that the, um, so, I, I think that I, I, I'm always interested in getting new ways to get people into the room to hear their ideas, because that's where we start building the, 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 the relationships and the skills for people to start to take on responsibilities. And that, you know, that at one point I was just somebody who just showed up at city council. I, I went to some neighborhood meetings, you know, it's just, and, and it's just like what you and Jeff are doing. Um, and, you know, that that's how you end up in, in these roles. I mean, you, 
I, I, Megan, you're here today be, in, in this role for the work that you've put in, you know, is, is with the city. And so that, um, and I think just opening up the doors and, and just getting more people into the room is, is it, it, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a foundation what? thing. Okay. And, and so I'm not just, and I'm not disagreeing with you with the way things kind of wash out as people go up the ladder. You know, we need to, we need to re, um, we need to open things up there. But I, the number one thing for me is getting people in the door and, and re, you know, and, and effectively feeling part of the process that, um, so, it takes an inordinate amount of privilege, you know, um, time and personal initiative for me to even be here on this committee right now. And that's something that a lot of, a lot of folks can't overcome, um, don't have, um, will never have. Um, and it's incumbent upon us to lower those barriers. Um, it's, you know, okay. Um, I, I think Member Napolitano wants to say something. I think I, it was uh, Councilor LaBarge was first and then we'll go to Jeff. Thank you. Um, some parts I have to agree with Megan, being a counselor for quite a long time. I found a lot of value by being in city council chambers and also getting to know people. Our residents here in the city of North Bantam when they came in, they would say, Counselor, I'd like to introduce myself. That's valuable. On Zooming, you cannot do this. It's not the same feeling. I, I feel that the open public session at City Council shows a transparency in the communication. Yes, we have the Zooming. I don't really like Zooming all the time. And we also had a problem where as counselors, we heard from many people that why don't we look at rotating our city council meetings at JFK and also rotate it back to council chambers. And I think it's a very good idea because parking is problems for a lot of people in the Florence area and also people who don't, you know, have transportation in that. So there's, I have to agree with you, Megan, on that special touch. I think it's so very, very valuable with that transparency and that total communication face to face. I see you, yes, but it's not the same like being at city council and we have no alternative right now because this is what we have to do. And it's not my choice. I prefer being at my council chambers, but I cannot do that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councilor Bard. Jeff? Um, so I just uh, sent to Laura, I sent you a, um, a link to the uh, the Re-Energizing Democracy Report, and I was actually just looking at page 12, um, which um, identifies in detail the barriers to participation. And I think that <clears throat> this is actually something I've actually talked to some folks about um, in the context of the Ordinance Commission. Uh, and I guess the question that I have is, are these things, um, are there barriers that are put up by ordinances or are these um, barriers that could be overcome through new ordinances or altering ordinances? Uh, and I don't necessarily know what the answer is. I suspect we could do some things um, or at least we could try to do something. Um, um, I'm, so I'm looking actually at page 12 when it- Did you want me to screen share that document or give you the- um... Sure. Ability to screen share? Sure. Okay, let's see. I can get it up one second. Page 12. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, because as somebody whose job it was involved going to city council meetings, I probably would not have gone 
uh, or been able to take the time to do that, um, to engage as much as I have if it wasn't part of my previous job. Um, and so I totally understand, um, and I'm on the relatively privileged side of things. Uh, so folks, you know, everyday people are going to have a lot more barriers and problems than, than I would. Um, and so I'm just wondering if we could, um, what happened? I don't know. I think I'm sharing if that looking, page. Yeah. This is page 12, but I'm not so this sure. Is, this is from the 2016 report that the, um, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission came up with. Um, okay. And just looking at the barriers of participation being, mm -hmm. are, is it something that we can address in an ordinance or? Um, I, I don't know, um, but it's worth taking a look at. I mean, there's also the, the issue of, um, one of the issues that I've had as somebody who's tried to do things around um, Western Massachusetts uh, and across the state is just there's also an issue of even if you had full control of you know the, the municipal power of Northampton um, would you still be able to change materially people's lives very much I think that's a critical question that um, remains to be seen like even if even if we abolish the city council and the mayor and we made a king of northampton who could do whatever a municipality is allowed to do could we actually materially improve people's lives could we address the um the the, the discrepancies that marginalized communities um experience i don't know i know that in some cases we couldn't um I know in some cases we might be able to make it a little bit easier. And so, um, I mean, in terms of access to the, you know, the, the, the government of the city, I think there might be things we could propose happen. Um, maybe they'll take place, they would take place in an ordinance. Maybe they wouldn't. I think that remote access is definitely, um, it, it should be on the table, at least as a, as a recommendation. I mean, just within my own um, uh, workplace environment um, and engaging in like union activities, it's definitely uh, uh, an improvement in terms of having not having to physically go to every single thing. Um, there's definitely benefits to that. Um, but um, yeah, I, don't know, I don't know if that's worth considering, yeah. Yeah, I've heard this come up, you know, um, over the last few years, um, these barriers to, to um, you know, running for office or even to volunteering for the city. I mean, as we know, you know, three out of the four so far, um, black and brown women who were on the Policing Review Commission have had to resign. Um, and these sort of these challenges are way more critical, much more acute for, for people of color. Um, and that's something that there's still growing awareness of, but we have, um, I think this is really helpful to, to see in writing, Jeff. Um, and I didn't get that in my email. Did Laura did you to send to oh. us? Oh, I could send the link too. Okay, let me just send that. Um, it was referenced in the in the charter re review report, but yeah. it, it wasn't linked. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I looked it up. So I. Um, and I, I sent the link to Laura. Um, I, yeah, and I'm going to send it to everybody else yeah. right now. Thank Mary. Thank yeah, Council Lobard. Thank you. Um, Jeff, I have to say that at a city council meetings, we've had parents come in with their children and also making recommendations that we actually have childcare so that parents mm -hmm. can participate. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, times are changed and parents want to be involved and it makes it very, very difficult for them because they have to pay for babysitters or whatever. So that was something that 
we have heard. Also, we've heard about the seven o'clock being too late and making city council start at six o'clock instead of seven o'clock. So these are things that I think that are very valuable. And these are young families who are coming forth to let us know how they feel and what the city should be looking at. Attorney Seawald. Don't need an ordinance for that. The city council can put that in their rules. The city council can control its own meetings. The mayor controls the meetings of other multiple member bodies and through the administrative order. So just as, as uh, the mayor has required a uh, public comment period for every executive board, uh, he, could, he or she could put that in the administrative order that there be child care as long as the city council funds it, um, you know that sort of thing. Uh, but again, these aren't ordinances; these are these are rules around the way these boards operate. Yeah. Um, right. And so, what I'm suggesting was figuring out which of these things are going to be ordinances and which wouldn't be ordinances, but maybe something else and what may not be able to be addressed at all at the municipal level. Uh, and incidentally, I'm, my camera's off because I'm actually making food for my kids who are eating very late tonight. <laughs> I did send the link now to the, of that document to everyone. Thank you, Laura. Megan? Um, I, I didn't have my hand raised, but I, no, I didn't see you. That's why I just wanted to make maybe just like we have this also the section topics for further study, mm -hmm. you know, similar to that in the report for the um, charter review. Okay. Topics that we can address through in specific ordinances. Yep. Current or future. Any other comments from any one of the members? Seeing none, we'll probably continue on into the next when we go into uh, next on the agenda, which is to discuss the contents of bucket number three, ordinances reviewed for impact on marginalized communities. What do we want to do with this bucket? Sorry, what do we want this bucket to include? So we've already been pretty much discussing um, a lot of marginalized communities impacts. What do we want to include in this bucket? Something for us to think about, this is why I wanted it on the um, agenda because right now there's nothing in bucket number three, even though I did just bring up about the Eviction Notification Act Housing Stability Notification Ordinance, that could be one, um, but we, probably need to figure out what we really want um, Attorney Seawall to be addressing in this bucket. Councillor Nash? I'm, you know, I get, I'm working on the same computer and I'm looking for my agenda and <laughs> And Laura, that, that eviction notification act uh, ordinance, we, we never put that in a bucket, did we? Oh, good question. Because I don't remember a specific vote. <laughs> um, we don't have to look now. We, we, we can come back and address this at the next meeting. I mean, that would have to be voted on anyway. I don't know what other bucket it would fall into at this point. But there are only choices. I mean, right, like we start the vote on it. Um, two is solicited and unsolicited recommendations for ordinance changes. Right. Um, ordinances, yeah. It's not a, so it's not a current one. It's a proposed one. Sorry, but I missed what the topic was. I, I missed, uh, 
seem to have missed what, which topic we're wondering what bucket uh, to put. That, that was the one I brought up earlier about the Eviction Notification Act, Housing Stability, oh. Stability Notification Ordinance that was brought before us by the Northampton Housing Partnership that could be included in bucket number three. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not before us right now, I'm just throwing it out there. Any other comments from suggestions from members? Some of the zoning zoning ordinances. We did go. We did have zoning um, that's currently being worked on right now, which is the two families by right, which is going to be heard Thursday at the joint meeting. Um, mm -hmm. um, Wayne Fighting did come to speak to us about that, so that's in the works. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that. Uh, um, we can, Attorney Seawald, um, we could throw that in bucket number three. I mean, is that something that you could, I mean, it's in the works already. Yes. Um, what... It was presented to our committee. Yeah. If that's something you'd like, again, are you making a recommendation to the council to do something or, or not do something? Uh, by the time we get this out, that's probably going to be already enacted, right. I would expect. Mm -hmm. I thought about, thank you. Attorney, uh, Councilor Nash. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've already sent two things over to the planning board to discuss. One had to do with that zoning notification. I, I feel like that falls into this bucket. Um, and that's an on, you know, the idea is to come up with a discussion that it might end up in an executive order. It might end up in an ordinance. Um, but that discussion is on the table. And also the, um, the matter that had to do with asking the planning board to really look at the way our parking requirements play out and really impact people who rent. Um, so um, I think both of those things fall into this per particular category, although they're still in the discussion stage. Right. Oh, turn to see well. I will say that the uh, the zoning notification is going to be an ordinance. It is not going to be an executive order because zoning is one of those things that the legislature requires an ordinance for. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to amend the zoning ordinance, it's going to be an ordinance. So that would go in bucket three as an ordinance. Councilor Nash. Uh, but Attorney Seawald, it, that, that in terms of uh, establishing a notification process that could be done by the mayor. And I believe that's the case with the posting of signs about planning board meetings and things like that. Mm -hmm. am I, am I, correct? I, I believe that was adopted voluntarily by the, uh, by the planning department because they just think that, that it's better notification because nobody looks at the legal notices anymore, except for me. And, uh, and Laura, so, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so they just, I think, you know, they do that as a matter of policy, but if you want to mandate uh, notice to abutters in addition to what's required under the Zoning Act, then that would be done through by ordinance. I mean, otherwise you're just going to leave it to the whim of, of the mayor and the planning department. And so maybe they'll do it, maybe they won't. Yes, that's part of the discussion. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> but right, it could end up as an or it, it it could well end up as an ordinance, um, but we'll see where this discussion leads us because I think, as you pointed out, um, in, in in one of our discussions, that it um, by making this requirement, we open the city up up to um, what's the word because we would. If we have it in the ordinance, then we are required to inform everybody by by right. And if we don't do that, we we may have um, impacted our public process. I didn't say it was a good idea, Councilor Nash. I said that the <laughs> idea would have to be in an ordinance. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that, Attorney Seawall. <laughs> Turn, uh, sorry, Councilor Labarge. Thank you, Councilor. Um, I sent 
an email today to Laura and Attorney Seawald, I think to Councillor Thorpe and right. Councillor Nash. From Karen Foster, she and I had a lengthy talk about an ordinance that's put in place and I, I can't answer to the date, but it's a long time that that language has never been changed and it has to do with the placards or either a license plate for handicapped or disabled people. And um, I really would like to have this committee look at this commission, look at that in Attorney Seawald because I'm not positive about that language. I never knew myself that, say I'm an employee working in the city hall and then I had a hip surgery done. I'm using that as an example. And I had difficulties walking where I parked my car. So, which means I would have to go to the parking division and get permission from them to be able to have a temporary placard on my car to um, have a closer area to walk. Is that how this is working? I don't understand that because there are temporary placards that as doctors, and I do have a doctor in the family, and with the placards or the handicapped plates, you go to your doctors, they are the ones that make that decision if you are capable of having a placard or a plate. And say for an example, like my husband, he's a veteran, but that he never wanted to have anything like that. But because of medical issues since last year, yes, he has to have a placard. So my question is that I don't understand how the parking department charges somebody who for a temporary placard. I, I don't understand this when the registry of motor vehicles, doctors make out the papers and it goes through the registry of motor vehicles and they handle it and they send it to you. So I'm confused with that ordinance also. And like I said, Councillor Foster and I, we had a monthly talk on Sunday over this. And also um, she's correct about New York. I have family there, I've been to New York and they do have different types of signage and they do have the wheelchair showing for wheelchair being handicapped. So, so I, hopefully we can look at that ordinance at some point and see no. that language. Council Labarge, I plan on having this on the, uh, um, I, I saw what you said, I'd like to have this on the next agenda, at least have this posted. Oh, that'd be um, great, thank so you. So the public at least knows what we're, you know, what was just brought up along with that ordinance. So that way we can have this discussion at that time. So I, I will um, uh, make efforts to have what you sent at the next meeting so thank we can you. have a discussion on that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So. Much like I'm going to have to leave. I have a memorial service to attend online and also a family to get back to. Okay. Thank you, Megan, for, for all you do and uh, for being with us tonight. And I'll, I will be in touch. Thank you. And we're going to be wrapping up anyway by 7.30. So. Bye. Sorry to hear about your loss, Megan. <sighs> so, any, I think we have a, an idea as to what should be going in the bucket three. Um, and we might have some other ideas by the next meeting. Any other suggestions regarding the contents of bucket number three? Jeff, you're all, oh, oh Attorney Seawald. If, if this committee can figure out how to diversify committees, um, this has been an issue that I that is we've been grappling with. I have been doing this for 35 years. 
This is an issue 35 years ago in Amherst. It was been an issue on every mm -hmm. private board I've ever been on. It is a in, an intractable problem. And I, and if if somebody could come up with a, a solution, I would uh, I, it, that would be very commendable. But um, I'm just not sure what it is. I'll just leave it at that. One. I mean, it has to do with people's material conditions, which are not great. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't know. I think it's a, a larger issue, but yeah. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Seawall. Thank you, Jeff. No further comments? Okay. Next up on the agenda is the motion to adjourn. I'll make the okay. motion. Second. <laughs> motion made by Jeff Napolitano and seconded by Marion Labarge. Maybe back to chicken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Laura, roll call on the motion to adjourn. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And member Napolitano. Yes. Thank you all very much for being here. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.